Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on cemetery preservation with friends of Eastern Cemetery board members, Andy Harpool and Savannah Dar. I'm Betsy Hatfield, Executive Director of Preservation Kentucky, and we're delighted that you were able to join us today, and thank you for attending. We'll have time following the presentation for questions, but you're welcome to submit them throughout the webinar in the question tab sec section on your dashboard. Be sure to click send to all. Also in the, your dashboard or control panel, there are four handouts that Andy and Savannah will be discussing later on. For optimal viewing without interruption, you'll want to be sure to close out all of your programs and browser and turn your volume up. And also, we'll be recording today's webinar, and it will be available on Preservation Kentucky's YouTube channel and email to you in our follow-up email later today. Today's webinar presenters are cemetery preservation pros. Andy Harpool serves on the Jefferson County Cemetery Board and is board president of the Friends of Eastern Cemetery Volunteer Group in Louisville, a nonprofit he founded in 2013 while he was volunteering cleanup efforts there. Under Andy's leadership, Friends of Eastern Cemetery received the prestigious Ida Lee Willis Memorial Foundation Historic Preservation Award for Service to Preservation in 2015 in the Oakley Certificate of Merit from the Association for Gravestone Studies in 2016. He's put a lot of sweat and tears into Eastern Cemetery and has experienced a variety of challenges since the group's formation, such as perpetual stolen equipment and damaged headstones, but mostly has experienced successes, which is one of the reasons he and Savannah are presenting today. Andy is currently a construction project manager for Uncle Carl Dyson, which specializes in home renovation. Savannah Dar is vice president of the Friends of Eastern Cemetery Board of Directors. She has co-authored numerous archaeology and architectural survey reports and presented at various workshops and conferences. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Communications from Western Kentucky University and her Master's of Arts degree in History with a focus on historic preservation and a public history certificate from the University of Louisville. Savannah received Preservation Kentucky's Young Professional Leadership Award 2016. She is currently a planning and design coordinator for Louisville Metro Government, where she works with Metro's historic preservation districts, writes and manages grants for historic building surveys and presentations, and conducts internal Section 106 reviews. The Friends of Eastern Cemetery nonprofit has been an example of best, best practices for others. Andy and Savannah have given numerous presentations for a variety of groups, including Friends of Cemetery Groups, Genealogical Societies, and Historical Societies. Both of them were trained by nationally respected stone conservator Jonathan Appel, who led a cemetery preservation workshop for Preservation Kentucky at Perryville's Hillcrest Cemetery in 2011. We'll provide their emails and website addresses at the end of the presentation so that you'll know how to contact them in the future. And with that, I'll turn the screen over to Andy and Savannah. Well, uh, give me just a second. Here we go. Here we go. Thanks, Betsy. I'm Savannah. And I'm Andy. <laughs> and as she said, we're with the Friends of Eastern Cemetery. This is the lovely Eastern Cemetery. It's on Baxter Avenue in Louisville, Kentucky. It's right next door to Cave Hill. So if you know where Cave Hill is, you can certainly find us as well. Um, you want to talk a little bit about today? Yeah, so Eastern um, Eastern Cemetery was is one of Louisville's oldest cemeteries. It was first incorporated in 1848 um, alongside of Cave Hill. It uh, it was started off as a Methodist cemetery and and ran that way until around the turn of the century. Um, also around that same time, the first reports of uh, of wrongdoing started to surface around there. And 
that went on for around another another 80 or 90 years uh, up until the late 1980s when a uh, an employee uh, called the attorney general's office and told them that they needed to come investigate uh, because there were some shady practices going on. When they came and did the investigation, uh, they figured out through records and through archaeologists that Eastern Cemetery is extremely overburied. Uh, there's documentation to support that, there, that there's around 138,000 people buried in around 16,000 graves. So for every headstone you see, that's around nine people on average uh, that are buried at Eastern Cemetery. With all of that going on, um, it didn't take long before Eastern Cemetery was out of business for good. And that's what led it to the abandoned state that, that it's in. Uh, the Friends of Eastern Cemetery, we started our group in, in March of 2013, just out of necessity. The, the grass there was around seven feet tall throughout most of the cemetery. And there were, trees that had fallen all over the property. There was homeless camps, um, garbage, vandalism. So it needed to be done. So that's what we do. So we can start with this quote, the most disrespectful thing to do to the dead is to forget them. Surrounding the dead with the living and with museum-like activities <clears throat> ensures that the dead will not be forgotten. And this is something we're constantly thinking about at Eastern Cemetery and with any other cemetery that we look at is trying to honor those dead and never forgetting them. So let's kind of get into some of the preservation um, items with cemeteries. And this is something that Andy and I learned uh, from Eastern Cemetery, but also from our training that we have done time and time again. And before you even start thinking about going into a cemetery and touching anything, you have to research your cemetery laws. Each state has its own set of cemetery laws and its own set of what is and is not appropriate in a cemetery. So you really wanna make sure you know what those are. One of the handouts to the side are the Kentucky Revised Statutes. Um, these are from the University of Louisville's website and we have put them in a PDF um, for your reference. Um, but something about Kentucky, there are ingress, egress, regress laws, and that's, you know, entering, leaving, moving around, those are those sorts of laws. And in Kentucky, for an abandoned cemetery, really the only people that are supposed to be in it are descendants of those buried there. And so it's really important to know, are you technically trespassing on the cemetery you want to do work in? And um, try to figure out a way to get permission to do the work there. The Friends of Eastern Cemetery has gone to um, Jefferson County Circuit Court, and we have permission from a judge to do the things that we do inside the cemetery to make sure that we are um, above board in everything that we do, and we are very transparent in everything that we do because our goal is to preserve and protect Eastern Cemetery. That is our only goal, really. And of course, you want to research cleaning. And we will talk a lot about cleaning and the do's and don'ts in the cemetery, but it's so good to really read a lot of those resources that are out there, the professional resources that are out there, so that you know what should and shouldn't be done. And of course, you want to look into recordation. So if you're going to go into a cemetery and you're going to be cleaning these headstones, you need to know where the headstones are. You need to know who the people are there. You need to know what are the features there. Are there paved paths? Are there driveways? Are there buildings? Are there trees? So it's really important to know the features of your cemetery and its history of your cemetery. Like with Eastern, it's very important for us to know that every headstone that we see is not every person buried at Eastern. So when we are trying to find a specific individual, we may not be able to find their headstone. And so that gives us a clue into what's going on at the cemetery. So it's always good to know, are all of your graves marked? Do you have records for all the burials there? It really helps you figure out the cemetery that you want to work on. So let's kind of go over some examples of historic cemeteries. Um, of course, the earliest, you have a frontier grave, single gravestone, um, could be in the middle of nowhere, alongside a road, something along those lines. 
You also have the church graveyard. So these are any of the cemeteries graveyards that are so associated with church buildings that are still standing or may no longer be standing. You have domestic community cemeteries. This one on the left is in the middle of a farmer's field, um, which used to be several farms that all touched at this point. And so these are the families um, who used to own that property, who no longer own that property. Then you have rural cemeteries. This was really a Victorian era concept of developing these beautiful places that were park-like and you would want to go visit and stroll your carriage through and you would picnic here. And so you would build in features like hills and streams. And um, you can kind of think of Cave Hill if you're from Louisville. This is a very well-designed rural cemetery with ponds and um, all these trees and the trees will flower at different times of year because the Victorian era was very into the beautification of death and rejoicing that death. So you really see these rural cemeteries come about in that time. Then we have more modern style cemeteries. You have memorial parks where all the graves are very flat. They may have the urns, they may not have urns for flowers. You of course have your military cemeteries which are uh, federally regulated with the federal stones. And then some other examples, potter's fields, which of course are still in existence, but were in existence historically, which are mostly unmarked graves. You have ethnic cemeteries um, for various populations in Texas. They have a large um, group of Latino historic cemeteries, which are very interesting and very different from Christian cemeteries. And then of course you have public city cemeteries. Um, throughout most cities that were publicly funded. And then as I kind of briefly mentioned this before, understanding your cemetery's features. Your cemetery has a designated entrance, potentially with an iron fence. Maybe it's a stone fence. Maybe your fence is no longer standing. You have enclosures, not just around the cemetery itself, but maybe even around individual grave plots. You may have um, some uh, concrete coping or curbing around certain cemeteries. You may have small iron fences, roads, walkways, vegetation. There's a lot of vegetation that's specifically associated with cemeteries, cypress trees, um, willow trees. You'll see yucca, you'll see um, various roses, you'll see various different flowers and trees that are associated with death. Um, you'll see water, as I mentioned, with some of those rural cemeteries, water was a big component, adding in lakes and ponds and things. Buildings, of course, you saw in the first photo of Eastern Cemetery, we have a wake house. That's one of our buildings. We also have a, a columbarium, crematorium on site. And then, of course, you always have your grave markers and your monuments and things like that. We also just kind of wanted to show you some his, uh, headstone examples. There's so many different types of headstones out there. It's really hard to condense them into a couple of slides. There's so many um, types with the obelisks or even the Gothic like that, or just a simple tablet, which is arched. And of course we at Eastern have a lot of these and we even have the flat lawn type. And then this photo on the right is showing you that this stone actually has a maker's mark in that bottom right hand corner. So this can also tell you a lot about your cemetery. If you have stones with maker's marks, it tells you about the history of your city. And this stone was made in Memphis, but this burial is in Kentucky. So it also kind of tells you something about that family. Why would they order a stone from a maker in Memphis when they lived in Kentucky? So it, there's always lots of clues to your cemetery. Of course, we need to include some symbolism. This is a huge part of any cemetery and understanding the people within. It's not only the symbols of um, death or Christianity or any other religion. You also have the fraternal organization symbols and you have the Freemasons and the Odd Fellows and the Woodmen. Um, we also have Order of Eastern Star, which we have some of those out at Eastern as well. And so these are all important clues into understanding your historic cemetery. So first order of business when you go into um, a cemetery for to visit or, or for repair, um, anything, everything, always safety first. Uh, at Eastern, we have lots and lots and lots of monuments that uh, the, 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 the compounds that join the different stones over time have broken down and 
if the base is sitting on level and the whole thing's leaning, if somebody was to just kind of go brush up against it, uh, it, it's, it's very possible that it could fall over. Um, there are more and more uh, reports on the news, it seems like in the last couple of years, of people getting hurt or killed in cemeteries uh, because of gravestones falling over. You, you, you think of you think of gravestones as a as a big solid stone, but you know the taller they are, the more parts they're made up of. And for in between every part, each mating area, there has to be some some sort of uh, of a binding agent that that holds it together, that keeps it from uh, falling over if it's bumped or hit with a lawnmower or or if a tree limb falls and hits it and these these things do break down gravestones do require maintenance so always be careful when you know when when you go into the cemeteries for any reason um not only should you be careful with gravestones so that they don't fall on you and, and hurt you but there are also a lot of things that hurt hurt the, the gravestones themselves um you know the we, we've we've seen so many times at eastern and and on the internet uh on social media uh, people people with good intentions can can actually end up doing a lot of damage because they haven't taken the time to properly educate themselves on the safe practices of of gravestone uh restoration and cleaning um when I when I first started doing work at at Eastern, there, you know, obviously thousands of stones out there that you couldn't read because of the lichens or or moss or what have you that's grown on them. And I had all these ideas of ways to clean uh, to clean them off because of my other backgrounds, you know, with metal and this and that. And I thought about pressure washing, uh, using muriatic acid, uh, sandblasting, and I decided early on, thank goodness, to to get training and do research. And what I learned is systematically every idea I had on how to clean a stone uh, would have destroyed every stone I touched. So I was really glad that I, I had the forethought to, to get training first. Um, on this on this slide, you'll see um, things that 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 damage stones. Um, you know, if people have trouble reading a stone, a lot of times they'll try different methods to, to see it. Uh, you know, as kids, we were all taught to do the gravestone rubbings with a piece of paper and a pencil. Well, it turns out that if you do that, the, the graphite, uh, rubbing even through the paper on the corners of letters and numbers actually breaks the corners down because, you know, after, over time, the, the marble or, or limestone or sandstone, it's pretty brittle. So when you take a pencil across it and, and you start breaking down the corners over time, it just gets worse and worse and worse until eventually there's there's nothing left, no letters left. Um, thereby destroying the last thing that is a memorial for the person buried there. Um, in, in, in this list on this slide, there's a lot of household items that you know people have, have used before over the years to try and read things and you think well how could flour be bad well flour has bleach in it and bleach gets into the pores and it's uh it's corrosive it has a corrosive value to it so it will actually deteriorate away um the different stones chalk is is a stone in essence so when you're rubbing a stone on a stone it deteriorates away surface area um paint, bleach, peroxide, shaving cream, everything on here has some form of either like a caustic or a corrosive value. And so it will do damage. It may not do damage while you're there. You may not see the damage, but over time it will do damage and it will, uh, it, it, it will speed up the process of deterioration. So part of, part of gravestone preservation um is is teaching proper ways to do several types of things but one of the things is to read the stones um instead of instead of taking and and using the the materials and chemicals that are bad for it 
Uh, there's a couple different ways that you can read it without doing any harm. Um, mirrors and lights. If you take lights or mirrors and, and try from different angles, you know, broadcasting light across the letters and numbers, a lot of times you can you can actually make out what you couldn't read before. Uh, another way is camera filters. Um, these new handy dandy smartphones have all kinds of different options now for for the uh, for picture taking photography, uh, and they have pretty user friendly filter programs on them that that let you change um, light, dark, shadows, pretty much anything, any different aspect of the picture. And when you play around with those, it it a lot of times you'll be able to see things that you can't see just from the regular picture. Um, Instagram has a very user friendly filter program that I use when I when I want to read a stone uh, and it it does a, a really good job and it's, you don't have to be too uh, too tech savvy to figure it out it has little slides you can go up and down and see instantly the the, the changes that it makes so sometimes you also just use mother nature when we were out at, <clears throat> excuse me when we were out at the cemetery last I was telling Andy it was the perfect time of day and the perfect shade that I had that I was actually taking photos of graves that we hadn't been able to read and it was just the perfect shadow was being cast and so it's going out during different times of day is the morning light better for the cemetery is the afternoon light better for the cemetery is it dusk to where you're getting those shadows across those headstones and actually being able to read things that you hadn't been able to read before Okay, so now for you preservation-minded people that want to get, get into gravestone restoration and preservation, um, back to what, what we will keep coming back to, uh, and that is a lot, of, a lot of people with good intentions have done a lot of damage. Um, there are people who try all kinds of different methods to clean off gravestones. And unfortunately, uh, there are very few methods that are actually safe practices. Um, bleach and other chemicals are, are generally not good to use. They, they have anything that in the MSDS data sheet has anything that's caustic or corrosive. Um, is not acceptable to use on, on, on stones. You know, it's not your driveway, it's not your sidewalk. It, it, it can't be re-poured later if, if you do damage to it. It's, once it's gone, unfortunately it's gone. So you have to be very careful with it. Um, wire brushes are bad because they obviously take off surface area. Spinning wire brushes on a drill are even worse because you can do more damage even faster. Um, unfortunately, in uh, in some of our surrounding states, there are companies that, that go around to small family cemeteries and they contact the townships and say, hey, for, for X amount of dollars, we'll go through and restore your cemetery and make it look beautiful. And the townships, not really educated on the safe practices of gravestone restoration, We'll say that sounds fantastic so the people will go out to the cemeteries and use the nylox brushes on on uh, drills and we've even seen people that use grinders with with sanding discs or grinding discs go and resurface the the face of a gravestone because once it's done it looks shiny and new except for they've taken off a, a quarter inch or a half inch of, of surface material knocking hundreds and hundreds of years of, of the stone's life expectancy off in a matter of minutes to make a profit. Um, on, on the same note, down the left-hand corner, it, it's probably not the safest of practices to uh, use duct tape to, to hold monuments together. <laughs> duct tape at some point more than likely will fail. And it, it also will pull off surface material because it's sticky. So no duct tape. Generally, what we tell people is if you want to do gravestone repair, you're not going to find anything at your local hardware store um, that that is going to be acceptable to use. So what we use and we recommend that people use 
And there are a few other uh, chemicals that that are okay, but we normally we use D2. Um, it's been it's been inspected and tried and approved by by the people that matter, uh, the NCPTT. That's the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Um, they're funded. They're part of the Department of the Interior and the Park Service. And they have a whole cemetery conservation um, arm of their work, and they focus on testing chemicals, testing methods, and going around the country and helping people restore historic cemeteries. Yeah, so they ran they ran D two mm -hmm. through the ringer, and and they approved it. So good enough for them. It's good enough for us. <laughs> it's not necessarily inexpensive, but you know, with some things, uh, some things are priceless. And if you're going to restore a, a stone that is the monument for a person's life, you know, if you if you can't afford to get the D2 and, and clean it in the responsible way, then don't touch it at all. Um, because, we, you know, we're, we're back again. Good people uh, do do things that that they shouldn't with, you know, with with good intentions, but they do damage. So D2, depending on how much uh, moss and lichens and, and biological growth is on the stone, um, you can cut it with water. Uh, we've we've gone all the way to a 50-50 mix. Generally, we use like a 70-30 or an 80-20. If the if the buildup is is extreme, then we will go straight D2. Um, put it in like a, one of those little pump up garden sprayers. And we we wet the stone down first, and we use soft plastic uh, bristle brushes and plastic scrapers to to remove as much as possible. Then we spray it down with the D2, and go back with the with the soft soft bristle brushes and and really work it in. And let it sit there for a few minutes, and then and then spray it off. Um, it's it's a process that we use to not only clean the the where the letters and you know the faces of the stone but also the on the on the multi-piece stones we use it to clean the mating surfaces where we're going to put epoxies and monument compounds kind of like as you can see in this picture so <clears throat> d2 is is nice because it gets things very clean um right as you as you're cleaning it but uh it also keeps working for weeks and every time you come back, you'll see the progress. It gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. But it, it works really well for projects like like what you see in this slide now, where we took a, a stone that had been knocked over, fallen over, and and uh, we reassembled it and put all the all the binding agents back together so that it's level and in one piece the way it should be. Um, here's an example of a, a really cool. Uh, Victorian uh, gravestone that we did. You know, this is a stone we looked at for years because it's kind of right by the area where we have our our, our volunteer meetings every every time we have a volunteer day. And we saw it, and it's you know you couldn't read, it. you wouldn't have even known that it had words or letters on it. It was so covered in in biological growth. Um, and so we sprayed it down, gave it a, a good rubbing with uh, the soft bristle brush, and and this is this is the difference. And here's another here's another uh, pretty typical of of the uh, veteran uh, marble stones out there. The the marble is is very porous, and biological growth digs in and and grows its little garden right up the front and backs of them. So. D2 really makes a big difference when you come in and clean it responsibly. Here's another. All right, so when if, when you want to start to work on stones, know your limits um, and and get get training. You know, do as much research as you can before you ever do anything because once you do damage you can't undo the damage. And unfortunately, it's not, you know, a person's gravestone is not something you can just run to Target and buy a new one if you screw it up. So 
be, you know, the first rule of, of, of cemetery marker preservation is first do no damage. Um, that being said, we'll, we'll, the next couple of slides will kind of go over how, how we do different stones um, as depending on, on what their need is. So like this flat stone, um, we run into, the, into this a lot at Eastern. They just, over time they start to sink because they don't have a proper um, foundation built. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of monument companies come out and, and pour, a, pour a bag of sackcrete in, into a hole and, and then set the monument on top of it. Um, contrary to popular belief, concrete is not a good uh, foundation for gravestones. You know, you think it's good enough for your house, it should be good enough for a gravestone. But wh what you see is, you know, if you walk out into your backyard and you have garden pavers, every every year or so you have to go back out, pull them up out of the ground and put more dirt down because they sink in. You have a lot of weight with gravestones on a very small footprint. And so between water and soil erosion and bugs that dig little tunnels under it, the stone has no other option than to start to sink. So concrete will do the exact same thing. So what we do is we take the stone up. Um, we we just dig a trench first. Yeah, we, 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 we dig a trench around it so that we can see all the corners. You want to be very careful that you don't, you know, ding the sides of the stone with the, with the shovel. But it's also important that you, you can see the whole stone just in case it's it's stepped up or stepped down on the on the edges that are underground. So dig the trench out so you can see the, the footprint. And then it's a it's a good idea to take like a, a handheld like a a tamper and flatten out where your base will be. Um, get the soil good and, and level and then put down some landscaping cloth. Uh, which kind of helps keep the bugs and, and whatnot, you know, out of, out of the area over time. And it also holds the, the gravel and the sand in place. So once you have your, your basic footprint for the, for the foundation in place, then you, you put gravel in. Now, depending on how big a stone, how, how heavy a stone, you'll use different thicknesses of, of, of gravel and sand. With, with the stone we're doing in this picture, it's about three inches thick. It probably weighs around 40 pounds. So we, we put like around a three inch foundation of, of gravel down and that'll be sufficient. The advantage of using gravel rather than concrete is bugs can go through it. Um, they're not going to tunnel through it. So there really won't be a lot of ground deterioration and water instead of eroding uh, the way dirt will. Uh, under underneath concrete, the water will flow through it almost like an like a irrigation system, and it'll pass on into the into the soil without disturbing the the foundation of the stone. So the uh, the the gravel and sand foundations are a lot a lot less maintenance than say a concrete uh, a concrete foundation would be. So after you get the gravel down, you take the 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 weighted tamper and you and you pack the gravel in until it's good and tight. And then we take <clears throat> about enough sand to put um, a layer over all the gravel. To, you don't have to put a lot, but just enough to where you can't see the sand or the gravel. And then you tamp that in. And what that does is it fills in the, the gaps of, of the gravel to where it's not gonna settle and, and kind of move around over time. It, it kind of locks it all in. It also makes it, a lot easier when when you put the stone back on um, to level it because you can kind of work with the sand where if it was just the gravel it, it it's not as user friendly so once you have have the gravel and the sand and it's all packed down really well then you can take the stone back on and uh, and as soon as you have the stone back on and you have it level then you want to start bringing the dirt back in and packing it around the sides and and do it lightly and keep the levels on it because you can it's pretty easy to when you're when you're tamping down the, the dirt to knock it off level so once it's all done then you can and it's good and level and you have the dirt back in around the sides then uh then it's cleaning time and generally on like uh 
the uh, granite and bronze like this, we just we just use soap and a and a soft bristle brush to clean it. So this is what it looks like when it's finished. So the the next couple of slides here are an example of uh, a, a bigger like an obelisk style stone and uh, the multi piece. I think this one is what three, four, five, six. Six six pieces, um, and th we were contacted by a family that that this was somebody. Uh, I think it was a great great grandfather, maybe that uh, the stone had been knocked over. And I think a tree limb had had fallen from uh, Cave Hill <clears throat> and uh, knocked it over. So we uh, they contacted us and asked if we would repair it, and we said absolutely. And we were we were lucky. With this one, because at the time we didn't have our own crane, and uh, the the good people from Evans Monument Company contacted us and said that they would love to come out and help us do it. So that uh, that was a game changer on this on this monument. So this is this is kind of the process that that we started with. Um, we uh, we removed the different pieces. And then we start bringing the base up so that we can build our foundation. And once that's up, we build our foundation, same as on the small stone, just obviously a lot thicker. And this stone probably weighs 2,000 pounds fully assembled. So, you know, a, 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 at least a foot of gravel and sand should be used for something like that. Two feet wouldn't be too much, it, you know, you can't really go too much. So once we get the, the foundation in and and uh, leveled out, then we start the assembly process. So with each different piece, we uh, we clean the mating surfaces so that when we put the epoxies and the and the monument compound on, everything has a good bond. So here we have we're putting the uh, the monument compound on, which is kind of like a weather stripping. You put the epoxies in, and if you don't have a monument compound, then when it rains. The water can get in between the stones, and if it's cold, if it's winter time, then the water will freeze. Uh, freezing causes expansion, and that's so if the stones are pushing apart because there's water in between them, that's what will break down the the binding compounds that hold it together. So this is going back together, and she's cleaning up the the mating surface for the big part, and lift off <laughs> so piece by piece level by level um, we use the same techniques we clean it use the same compounds and epoxies and just build it from the bottom to the top and now it's on a on a level base and it has all new binding binding compounds so once it's all together it's it's good for another however many years And that's it, all finished. So something else we really focus on with the Friends of Eastern Cemetery, since we are a volunteer nonprofit, we are always trying to bring people out to the cemetery, whether that's with our Memorial Day flagging, our Veteran Day flagging to honor our veteran graves, whether that's um, with Reads Across America, which also honors our veteran graves, whether we are doing tours or anything like that, we are you know, we are constantly trying to bring people back to Eastern and educate them about Eastern and cemeteries in general. We're just really trying to promote the proper methods and the proper respect and the history of these cemeteries. And so I have some photos here. You can see that's wreaths across America at the left, which are wreaths that you can purchase to honor veterans, as well as the flags that we do on the right hand side. Our group has even participated in some of the local parades and fairs and things because we're constantly trying to educate. We're constantly trying to bring awareness to not only Eastern, but some of the issues that are happening across the nation. And then on the right hand side, you can see one of our tour guides, that's Joel, um, is giving a tour in, in the rain. So those poor people, they're fantastic for being out there. Um, but we try to do tours and we're, we're really trying to have so much community involvement because as a volunteer group, I mean, that's what it is. We need the community to help support us. It takes all of us to really bring Eastern back and to help educate everyone about these amazing cemeteries.
Okay. We're going to go to questions and answers now. And you can, if you haven't already, you can start putting your questions into the question tab on your control panel. Question, I've seen wet and forget advertised for cleaning and restoring cemetery stones, but I've also seen that no long-term research has been done regarding its safety as compared to D2. Wet and forget may be fine for the vinyl siding of my house, but what about 100 plus year old gravestones? So if you, if you, it, it, it's, it's a very simple formula on, on, on which, uh, which chemicals to use and which chemicals not to use. Um, if, you, if you do just a little research on wet it and forget it, if you look into the MSDS data sheets on it, it contains sodium, which is salt, and salt is corrosive and will do damage. So even though wet it and forget it sounds fun and easy and quick, it is not a responsible product to use for gravestone restoration. Our family burial ground is owned by one of the local churches. The minister fired the groundskeeper and has been doing the upkeep himself. We recently noticed that to save time, he has been using Roundup around the bottom of the headstones so he doesn't have to spend time weed whacking. What kind of an effect will this have on the life of the stones? And is there any legal recourse to stop him from doing this since according to Kentucky statutes, the stones belong to the family and not the church? Well, there, there's three problems uh, with, with Roundup um, and what he's doing. So one problem that, that Roundup, it obviously contains sodium and a lot of other corrosive uh, chemicals, so it, it'll do damage to the stone um by spraying it on it i mean any any contact that roundup has with a stone will definitely do damage the other problem with spraying it around stones is um roundup will kill the grass and the weeds that are around it which he thinks is making it easier to cut the grass because then you don't have to weed eat around the stones the problem with that is um, when you kill the grass, you're killing the root system of the grass. The root system of the grass and weeds and whatever around the stone um, are, are what tie the soil in and, and, and keeps everything uh, nice and tight around the base. So when you kill, kill off the, the grass, weeds, and the root system dies off, then the next time it rains, the soil around the, the base of the stone uh, will begin to erode and it will run down a hill run you know away from the stone it might run down under the stone on one side which if you've ever walked into a cemetery and you see leaning leaning stones it's due to soil erosion which is drastically sped up by killing the the root systems around it um yeah the the legal recourse do you you have I'm not sure about that, but honestly, we could um, look into that a little bit and get back to you. We have a lot of legal issues out at Eastern Cemetery, and we work really closely with the county attorney, or not county attorney. Um, attorney general. Attorney general. Thank you. Sorry. Attorney general's office for the state, and they have been very helpful with us in helping us figure out some of the statutes and some of the things that we should and shouldn't do. Um since we are not the owners of the property. So it might be worth reaching out to the attorney general's office um, to see what recourse, if any, there might be. Well, and that's something else to keep in mind too, is, is, is cemeteries aren't governed by local laws. They're governed by state statutes. Um, so, you know, you can, if there's something going on in a local cemetery that you don't like, you can, of course you can reach out to the, to the local government, see if they'll help, but um, also be aware that the, the state or the, the the laws are at a at a state level. So the attorney general, um, I think the the customer fraud mm -hmm. prevention department is is who oversees Eastern. So that uh, you know, and nobody wants to get a call from the attorney general's office. So if somebody's doing something they shouldn't be, 
and they get the call, they're, they're you know, if they're smart, they'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to pay attention. Right. What are, <laughs> what are recommended techniques for photographing gravestones so that the engravings are actually readable in the photos? Well, we've shown some of that. Um, with the filters, with using lights and mirrors, I'm telling you, using light and creating shadow, that is really your best friend out there. And honestly, some stones are just too far gone. I mean, we have really, really hard rains here. And depending on if the stone is upright or sometimes if the stone is fallen and it's on its backside and the inscription is facing up, I mean, sometimes things are just lost to Mother Nature and there's no coming back from that, unfortunately, but there are lots of techniques for doing that. Can you tell me how you get your volunteers? Social media, social media. <laughs> Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Make it fun, um, have food and drinks, and promise free sun tanning and boot camp. <laughs> We're always on, especially Facebook, we're really branching out to try Instagram and Twitter a bit more, but we're very active on Facebook. We have a strong Facebook following. And um, so it's really how we find most of our volunteers. And then, you know, Andy and I do <clears throat> presentations like this. And so people refer us to other people who refer us to other people. And they're like, hey, I just moved to town. I'd love to get involved with your cemetery. And so it's it's just really trying to get out there and drive up that community involvement that we talk about yeah and, and as part of this webinar each and every one of you listening is, is now uh obligated to come out and volunteer <laughs> Eastern on, on at least the next four Sundays. do you have volunteers researching and creating a database of the individuals buried in eastern cemetery yes and no um, we, there have been people trying to do this since the eighties, honestly, when a lot of the overburial and corruption was discovered. Um, so we have lots of fragments and one of our long range goals of the friends of Eastern cemetery is to really get this compiled and to be more of a, um, one database that has a lot more accurate information than what we currently have. We just currently don't have a lot of accurate information. We have a lot a little bit here and there. And so um, we have been applying for grants and things to try to receive some of that funding um, to be able to do something a lot more comprehensive. So not yet, but it's on the horizon. And the person who asked that question, if, if you're looking for something to do, <laughs> you are our person. <laughs> I helped do history work for the city of Wayland in Floyd County. A few years ago, we discovered that the remains of an African-American cemetery in our town was very overrun with trees, weeds, etc. We need help preserving the area with, with, and re searching for additional tombstones and markers. Only a few tombstones remain, one we believe to mark the gravestone of a former slave. Any ideas who we can contact or that would be willing to travel to see the cemetery and help us preserve this very historic site? Your first step, of course, is to always figure out ownership. You need to figure out <clears throat> if there's a documented owner of the property and of the area, and if that company, person, what, whomever they may be, is still around. Um, if not, then try to find descendants of those people because, as I said, Kentucky has very strict ingress, egress laws. And so you need to make sure that you have the appropriate permissions to be in the cemetery um, because you could be considered trespassing. And honestly, you know, we've had this happen out at the cemetery where police are called and we're technically trespassing. And that was early days, you know, and so it, it is a real issue. It sounds kind of silly, but it is a real issue. And getting your local um, government involved is always a good step, too, because they may have documentation on the cemetery. They may not. But it's a good first step in getting some people involved in understanding what you're wanting to do. And it can help you figure some of those things out. For the uneducated, how do you determine the material used on the stone and the best method to clean it? We have some family stones we want to clean. Pretty sure the plates are bronze, but not sure about the stone itself. What will polish up the bronze? Oh, we've never really polished up our bronze. No, and, 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 
I've seen online there there's a lot of back and forth on what is acceptable um and what's not acceptable to use on bronze um and because generally we haven't had a whole lot of you know the bronze will tarnish to some degree at eastern um but unfortunately for us that at this point that's the least of our worries we you can still read the names and the dates on that so we haven't had we've spent more time with cutting the grass and, and fixing the the stones that have problems than bronze um as far as as far as stone identification um really the best thing to do is just get online and 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 research gravestone material identification you know typically what you see is, especially with with bronze affixed to it uh is going to be like granite um and granite is is a pretty pretty tough stone it it can you can you can do just about anything to granite and it stays pretty pretty solid so um if you can't identify it um you can never go wrong using d2 uh and also just water and a soft bristle brush will, will get you a long way with most stones We own a family, we own a historic property. Did I read just read that one? I think I did. Uh, we own a historic property in Maysville, Kentucky, which has a family cemetery included, but not owned by us. While I'm a distant relative of the builder, I am not a direct descendant of this family. What can we do to prevent further deterioration of this cemetery? I would try to get in touch with the family if possible. It sounds like you're somewhat connected. Um, try to get in touch with the family. Um, and it's really trying to rally some sort of care and involvement. And whether that's going to, like I said, your local government, whether that's going to your local um, magistrate or county um, council member or whomever sort of elected official you have, because those can really help you also draw interest and um, potentially even a little bit of money too to help you um, towards restoration it's getting your local community members together maybe you have a neighborhood association maybe you have um, historical society a genealogical society those are the things that you know finding like-minded people to really help rally around um, a cemetery can really help you get started what responsibility does the property owner have to maintain an old family cemetery, clear down trees, et cetera? Well, if the if the cemetery belongs to the property owner, then um, I don't know. I guess it depends on on if you're scared of your relative's ghost coming back and getting you. I don't know. Um, <laughs> if it's if it's just a random cemetery on your property that really you have no like connection to um I, I don't know that you have any obligation to do it however it's uh you know it's it's the right thing to do to take care of it and it's certainly in the state statute that the property owner should be maintaining the cemetery however it's not something that's necessarily um enforced very often if that helps <laughs> but do it anyway because do it. <laughs> we're cemetery people always do it <laughs> always do it that's our law wolf pen preservation association outside louisville is working on restoring a couple of 1800s to late 1900s cemeteries we've been using a small diameter rebar to probe for vertical stones buried in the family cemeteries many stones are field stones that were properly probably markers there in rows is there a ground penetrating sonar available for rent to try to locate other graves? That's a university question. And honestly, I would go to any anthropology or archaeology department at any of the Kentucky universities, and they're the ones to have that sort of equipment. There are some private companies that have that equipment, but that's going to be an astronomical price. So it's the universities who might be more willing to help um, with some of that equipment. But at the same time, what we've heard from a lot of uh, ground penetrating radar people is in this region, there's so much clay in the ground. A lot of times you get a ground penetrating radar out and there's not much to be seen because they don't see through the clay very well. 
So it also so it'll depend on your soil around your cemetery as well. But that's why you should reach out to those universities because they have the staff that could give you the best direction on that. Should you also be concerned with any local ordinances or do the state rules govern? Uh, state rules are your biggest rules, but your local ordinances are very important as well because that's what your local police officers might be enforcing if they get called out to the site because they don't know someone's working out there and someone called and said so and so is acting crazy in a cemetery. Not saying that will happen, but we've heard stories of that people cleaning up cemeteries, not letting their local law enforcement know and you know, people calling on them because they're afraid they're vandalizing or, you know, whatever. And so local ordinances should be followed as well. Well, and as strange as it sounds, a lot of the the local like police and, and um, government, they don't really even know the cemetery laws. They go by the, a lot of times they'll associate it with what their park laws or something like that, um, what, what those laws are, but they don't necessarily know uh, what the what the state statutes are for for cemeteries so w what we found is it's a good idea to look up all your statutes that apply to what it is you're doing get your permissions first and then print out and keep a copy of the statutes with you um, in case there's there's you know if somebody comes and there's some questions uh, if you can cite the statutes if you have them on hand you win <laughs> This is a comment, then it looks like we have one or two more questions. Some of the cemetery boards in Kentucky are not funded nor charged with cemetery care. Serving on those boards for those of us who want to make a difference is frustrating and the general public expects action, not discussion. Any comment on that? That's a very political issue and that's when i recommend getting with your elected officials and trying to make something happen jefferson county didn't have a cemetery board until two years ago when some constituents really lobbied our metro council to even create one and it's still in its very very early stages so that's really more of a political thing and trying to get your government to rally behind you and 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 generally the cemetery boards are more of an advocacy um wing more than anything uh generally there's not funding uh nor can they generate funding i don't think um so if, if and it is it's very frustrating uh but if it's you know if it's something that that you want to get done then you have to you, you have to figure out an angle to get the community excited about it you have to get your permissions in place first um and and that's the main thing and then figure out a way an angle to get people interested and 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 get volunteers in um you know there's there's lots of different things lots of different like events like tours um or, or gravestone cleaning workshops things like that that you can use that you know there oddly enough there are still people who want to come and volunteer um and will show up to a place full of strangers just to volunteer and they don't even necessarily care what it is so um get your permissions and then you know we hear people all the time that that say well we got this cemetery and and we who do we contact to get something going here and the answer is contact yourself um <laughs> do your due diligence and then get your get your materials and your tools together grab a couple buddies and go do it and if you build it they will come and that's something we've seen at Eastern since 2013. You know, there were a lot of volunteer groups before our volunteer groups out of the cemetery. So we had a hard time getting um, government officials to really rally behind us and help us. And actually, you know, some of them have given us a little bit of funding as well. Um, but it's because we've sustained. It's because we've kept going. We've lasted longer than any other group. So you really have to show your commitment. You really have to show that you're motivated to do this and you are going to do this. It took us at least four years before anybody in, in the in the city uh, government would even listen to us. Um, because just like anything else, you know, there's action and there's words. There's a lot of people who want to sit around and talk about what they're going to do at a cemetery. But that time is much better spent at the cemetery doing so that's what they look for is action 
Very good. The, this question you've you at, you really answered in the presentation, but I wanted to read it in case you had anything to add to it. It's in regard to old stones that are leaning at a severe angle. What must be done to write them? Are there companies that can write them? Is it possible for an amateur to write them? What would be the cost range? Mm. The first step is leave it as is. Um, just leave it. And then um, there are companies that will write them, but what you really need to figure out are, are these companies adept with historic stones or are they modern monument companies? Because that's actually a big difference. And so I would look for people who actually do stone conservation, who actually work with historic cemeteries rather than modern monument companies. Um, because we found that even at the cemetery that people who know historic stones are the ones who really understand the materials and the methods and have the best work and do the best results and do the least amount of harm. Yeah, and depending on, on where you are and, and what the the situation is for the cemetery, maybe it's time to to contact somebody who, who does workshops and, and if there's an, enough demand for for repair and enough people around who are interested, you know, maybe you could have a, a hands-on preservation workshop there. Yeah, and that stone can be one of your stones. We've done that. We've done two or three at Eastern with Jonathan Appel. And essentially, I mean, we pay for Jonathan Appel with the registration fees that we charge for the preservation workshops. And we pick some of the worst ones that we've kind of been afraid to tackle ourselves. And we're like, hey, John, can you help us with these? And so that's really been beneficial for us. Great answer. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Andy and Savannah, for such an informative webinar, just an outstanding presentation. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone that you'll receive a follow-up email today with a link to the, the recording and the four handouts. And we'll also include links to our Facebook pages and websites. And thank you. Just We really appreciate you all taking the time to attend and have a great afternoon and weekend. Thank you. Thanks, you guys.